This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. My examples would be quite short, but I think they can feed back also to what Simone was saying yesterday. So to start with, if we take um, traditional models of translation, um, I, you know, they, they tend to be based on, uh, on, on, a, on a binary. So if you think of um, whether it is the original and translated text or, or in more sort of the correct terms in translation studies when we talk about the source text, the target text, the source culture, the target culture, the source language, the target language, there's always this binarism that is inserted in, in, in standard models. And what is, um, if you look at the assumptions between that, what these models assume somehow is a wholeness, a coherence, and, co and a cohesion, and therefore also sort of possibility of an opposition between those two sides, those two extremes, which is extremely interesting for us when we look at minor literature, or indeed in that sense also I think small literatures, because the moment you make that step, and the moment you take that position and, and you take that perspective, that wholeness, that cohesiveness of cultures as if they were in themselves always coherent just goes um, you know, immediately. The first thing that minor literature does in the and government sense, but also in all sorts of other senses, is to explode that sense of a possible um, originary and original coherence. Now, at the core of that kind of model, there's also an ethics. When you look at what that model does in terms of the requirements it poses on translation and on the translator as an agent, an agent of course always writing with other, uh, working with other agents as we were hearing last night in the roundtable. But the, the, the requirement that that model poses on the translator is uh, an ethics uh, of faithfulness. Okay? And faithfulness obviously um, has, as it, at the other end, at the, other, at the opposite end, has betrayal. And Okay, we, we don't need to go there, but there's of course all kinds of underlying sexual connotations, and they were very explicit in some of the theories that emerged from this, you know, whether it's Le Bel Infidèle in, in France, or whether it's the figure, the emblematic figure of La Malinche in, uh, in the case of, of the Mexican culture in particular, but generally in the Hispanic form, uh, Hispanic form world, for instance. But also what interests me about this ethics of faithfulness is that somehow it insists on a kind of static nature of the relationship between the source depth and the target text. There is a, a self-contained text here, and at the end of the process, there's another self-contained text over here, and somehow the process of translation is dynamic, but it leads to another stasis, it leads to some kind, it leads to some kind of conclusion. And of course, there's a whole area of translation theory that has always opposed this. And you know, think of Benjamin, um, just, and, and that obviously tells you that, that you cannot stop the translation process in that way, um, as if it were self concluding If you look at more contemporary models of translation, um, which have been extremely successful, nevertheless, I think that binary somehow is, is still there, it's still present, it's still, still insisting on that binary. So if you take um, contemporary theories, um, and I'm thinking of Larry Venuti, but, but of course of the, the line that goes to get Venuti through Charlotte Schleiermacher and via Charlotte Schleiermacher to Antoine Berman and from Berman to Venuti. And this, again, somehow there is this idea of do you take the text to the reader, do you take the reader to the text, which is Charlotte Schleiermacher's point. Or if you look at Berman, Berman describes the properly ethical, so he uses the word ethics, the properly ethical aim of the translating act as receiving the foreign as foreign. And so somehow, again, there is this, this sense of something whole, something self-contained that, that has to be uh, transformed. So in the end, it seems to me, and, and then you, you find that um, imagery uh, repeated and, and uh, elaborated in, in Lawrence Benuti's idea of 
foreignizing and domesticated pronunciation, and again, these two extremes. And of course, there are sort of all kinds of gray areas in between, but these two extremes are interesting. And it seems to me that in the end, that dichotomy between foreignization and domestication only reiterates the question of faithfulness. To whom does the translator owe her allegiance? To the author, to the reader, and do the foreignizing, domesticating um, <coughs> gestures and, and strategies always carry the same weight, the same value, given that the balance of power between source language and target language, source culture and target language, indeed we were talking about this right now, are variable and are very contingent. So there is a kind of um, binary logics which I think is can be challenged. And I think that my literatures can help us precisely in challenging this binary logic. So my interest is in, you know, I, I start this from an interest in, in travel, in migration, and in mobility, and in connecting different forms of mobility and therefore translation as a form of cultural, textual, but also more broadly cultural mobility, and forms of geographical and social mobility. Now, when you look at the ethics and the aesthetics, and again, I would insist on this, this is something that was coming out very clearly yesterday in Margaret's paper and then in Therese and some of the others, that there is this connection between the aesthetics and the politics, the ethics the, the, of, of, uh, of texts. So there is a similar ethics when you look at the kind of contract that travel writing and also to a large extent writing connected to migration um, are expected to enter into. Um, in this case, it is an, an, an aesthetics and an ethics of authenticity. And Malachi opened yesterday the whole conference by saying, telling us that story of a writer being accused of being inauthentic to an ethnic background. And I think that this, again, this issue of authenticity is really interesting here. Um, there's the sense, in, the sense in which writing linked to travel and migration enters a form of what um, Lejeune called the autobiographical pact. It's factual writing, and therefore we expect a kind of truthfulness to life, truthfulness to reality, which is based partly on the idea of the, you know, I've been there, uh, I've done that, and I'm going to tell you the truth about it, okay? Now, realism, therefore, becomes, and, and, and representationality becomes the dominant aesthetics, um, which is implied in this kind of, of pact, in this kind of contract. And of course, realism in this sense is precisely also linked to ideas of truth and of adherence to reality as, as, as a form of truth making. What underneath the four, um, both models, um, the, the translation model and, and the, the travel and migration model to me, is an ethics of and the politics of, of truth, a demand for truth, which can only set up the translator and the migrant, the traveler, the writer, for a fall and for a failure, inevitably. Uh, because precisely by definition, they are in between, they are mediating, and also they are representing, <coughs> rewriting, transforming, and so there is always an anti-realist, an anti-representational element in what they are doing. And if you want you know, to go back to the very, very famous sentence, which has, is always attributed to Alfred Kuzvesky, the map is not the territory. And in the same way as we know, realism is not reality, even where um, writers and translators adhere to, to norms of realism. So truth, for me, if understood, and, and that those ethics of faithfulness, authenticity, etc., which are linked to a principle of truth at the core, if understood in absolute terms, seem to me uh, pose an, an impossible demand. Um, and postmodern thought, of course, starting from Derrida, but also Rorty, for instance, and others have made clear that this is the case. So what if we take a different route, which is a minoritizing um, route uh, towards this, and we think of translation in a different way, um, and then try to produce a different translation ethics and different translation politics. So what if we construct a different kind of ethics of translation and of travel and of the writing linked to these, which doesn't make absolute demands of truth and doesn't crave that kind of kind of final stability of arrival uh, that, that, that these models that I was talking about um, seem to want to demand, which doesn't hang on desperately, it seems to me, to the twin and intertwined idols of the source text and the target text, the source culture and the target culture, etc., as absolute, whole, coherent extremes in a fixed binary exchange. So 
before I get into what I what what the examples that I want to give you a little bit about um, what we can term again, we've used lots of labels, but minor writing, and in my case also in particular um, areas that have to do with migrant writing. And migrant writing is another of those labels. Simone was saying yesterday we can we can stop and, and talk about these labels forever, but we have to use some kind of label. So writing linked to migration is what I, I would want to um, describe it as. And I'm also interested in the phenomena. Um, and others have already spoken about this, which link um, writing connected to migration to processes of self-translation. Very often because writers position themselves precisely between cultures, between languages, because they are uh, polylingual subjects, uh, but also because they address multiple audiences, and that is, is key for me. It's also a question of address, um, as Naomi Sakai would say, and it's very often a heterolingual address that they are producing rather than uh, targeting themselves and thinking of themselves in a monolingual or, um, sort of world. And this is really interesting also for small literatures, and where I think minor literature and small literatures may still have points of contact, mm. because a writer like Achaga, a writer who is already bilingual, may make a choice, and will indeed make a choice politically to choose one language, but then is always already moving in a polylingual, in a multilingual context, in a multilingual world, in a multilingual logic. Although he may indeed make a very political choice within that context. So I don't need to talk about the Les and Gatteris principles again because we've spoken about them so much, but indeed it's important to, to point out again that between uh, that within um, that, those, that definition there is the deterritorialization, and indeed deterritorialization always goes hand in hand with reterritorialization. But there is also a collective element and there is a strongly political element to them. Um, what they see as minor literature. And you can connect this also to other contemporary theories uh, of writing, for instance, seeing the writer, and you can see the migrant writer in particular, as witness in the line that, that takes you um, through um, Arendt and, and, and Agamben, for instance. And what is interesting there is, that, again, the writer is not necessarily a witness to himself or to herself in a kind of autobiographical, direct, representational way. That much, much, um, it, but assumes a much more complex um, uh, position, where um, witnessing, voicing, and in, in using the term that Spivak would use, for instance, about translation, are much more complicated and also ethically complicated uh, engagements with the text and with the world around it. And to stress it again, so for me, what is interesting is as a migrant writer, um, in this notion of, of voicing, will have to negotiate, you know for whom and to whom he or she is speaking, uh, which ones are his or her multiple audiences, but also what kind of social responsibility are these writers taking on. And all of them do, it seems to me that in the vast majority of writers that I have read that, that would fit into these kinds of boundaries are very strongly, very consciously and openly taking on um, uh, writing as a form of social responsibility social engage engagement. And, and this is one of the um, connections I make also with Roti, who in Contingency, Irony, and Solidarity talks about solidarity um, as a form of social uh, responsibility and social investment. And he talks about the fact that solidarity, for instance, cannot come out of some kind of essentializing gesture with all humans, but it has to be, it has to come out of the recognition of what he calls a contingent recognition of similarities and dissimilarities. And again, if translation isn't about that, I don't know what it is about, precisely about that, that contingency of similarities and dissimilarities. So let me give you a couple of examples um, of, of, what, um, of the way in which writers that I've been working with um, negotiate and, and think about this issue of, um, of translation and self-translation as a form of um, of, of engagement, social responsibility, political um, um, engagement, and gaining a political voice, um, not as a form of realism, again, but in much more complex ways. And I won't have the time to go into lots of details, but I wanted to show you the websites of a couple of writers. This is Amara Khus. Amara um, is one of the most well-known voices at present in the Italian uh, literary and, and journalistic and, and kind of public uh, speech uh, panorama. 
And one of the reasons why I wanted to show you this website is because, interestingly, the first thing that he chooses to highlight on his own website is this. I Arabize the Italian and Italianize the Arabic. Io arabizzo l'italiano e italianizzo l'arabo. Ich arabizzo, etc., etc., etc. So it's actually um, this issue of linguistic translation and of the way in which he moves between languages is something that he chooses to foreground from the start. Now, translation is really interesting as a tool in the way that Amal al -Khus has developed. So al -Khus was um, is originally from Algeria. He um, moved into Italy um, in the, a number of years ago now, and um, partly for political reasons, or largely for political reasons. His very first book, which was self-published, um, is, is called the Cimi Cel Pirata in, in Italian, don't ask me to pronounce it in Arabic. Um, but it's one of those books that I, I was mentioning yesterday, uh, which, like Yoko Tawadas, like a couple of Yoko Tawadas um, books in German and Japanese, um, you cannot say where they start and where they end. It, it's not testo affronto, it's not facing page. What it is is two books in one, but the Arabic, of course, you start reading from this side, and the Italian you start reading from this side. So it's, it's like the god Janus in, in, uh, in uh, Roman mythology, in a sense. It's looking both ways, and it's meeting in the middle. But, um, that uh, text uh, was written first in Arabic by Lamara and then was uh, translated, but with a lot of uh, toing and froing and a lot of collaboration uh, by Francesco Leggio, who's um, a, a friend of Amara and an expert in, in Arabic um, and a translator. And um, it was later on republished a few years ago because uh, Amara had become much more famous, and it was republished actually in a monolingual edition, but in which the paratext foregrounds the history of translation of the text, and Leggio himself has got a piece in there, and Amara um, foregrounds the history of translation of uh, the book. The second book, which again was written both in Arabic and in Italian, but more in parallel um, in, in that case, foregrounds, so it's not published in this case um, in, in one edition, the editions are separate, but it foregrounds its difference and the existence of, of, of an issue with translation by having two substantially different titles. So in Italian, it is called Scontro per una scienzore a Piazza Vittorio, uh, which is something like Clash over an elevator in Piazza Vittorio, which is one of these iconic places of multilingual Italy and, and multi-ethnic Rome in this case. But in, in uh, the Arabic title, well, the Arabic title translates loosely as how to be suckled by a she-wolf, a Roman she-wolf, of course, without getting bitten. So the title, the difference in the title immediately foregrounds that some, something is happening with the text, that this self-translation, and in this case a matter of self-translating, although possibly again with sort of consultancies, but he was self-translating, and here he is actually signaling that you know the bilingual reader, the multilingual reader, may have access to two different texts, while the monolingual reader will always be missing out on something. And then subsequent texts, um, you know, some subsequent uh, books by Amara also make use of, of Italian dialects, for instance, and there he worked again with informants, including, including uh, Federica Massara here at UCL, sort of consulting on different, uh, different languages that, that he was using. So, um, and the other thing that happens constantly uh, with, um, with Amara, and which was coming out this morning in the question that you were asking, uh, is that translators, um, official translators, professional translators, not professional translators, are very, very often protagonists of this text. And this is something that, again, certainly in the case of Italian, uh, Italophone writing, Italian writing produced by people connected to migration in different ways, it's a very, very common and recurring um, sort of figure of thinking about you know, many of the other uh, writers that, um, that Simone was talking about yesterday, that this happens too. The second case that I wanted to talk about briefly was mentioned by, by um, Simone yesterday, and is the case of Ijava Shegel. In the case of Ijava Shegel, um, the processes of translation are much more the kind of processes that Simone was describing, where the, the texts that Ijava produces are, are texts which are already, always written with forms of translation embedded within them. They wouldn't exist without processes of translation and of self-translation. The texts that somehow are inherently emerging from those processes. But she plays with them in all kinds of different ways. So in some cases, as what I was saying, she projects herself as entirely as an Italian. In some cases, she presents herself mostly as Somali. In some cases, migrant. And the linguistic strategies of translation that she uses are very much changed 
according to those um, self positionings. But they changed in ways that are very political again. Java, like Amara, is a very um, visible, audible uh, voice in the Italian panorama. And, and she also plays very intentionally from the start, not just with, say, uh, the languages of her Somali background and Italian. But there is English in there, there is Spanish, there is all kinds of other things. So this kind of polymorphic uh, uh, world is very important for her. And I've heard her speak about this and speak about this complexity of the matter. And it's really intriguing because um, last week I was in Lisbon and Yoko Tawada was there. And Yoko had this fantastic way of explaining and saying, you know, I, I'm not... People ask me whether I'm one, two, three, four, possibly five different people. I'm not. I'm the same person, and there is a network and a layering of languages and cultures and so on. And she was also asked, apparently, a number of times, she was saying, so, you know, you've lived 30 years in Germany, have you changed? And I was thinking, what a stupid question is that? You know, who hasn't changed in 30 years, and why? You know? and, and if you think about it, it, it's really intuitively true. But at the same time, this sense in which and I, I always think in these cases of the opposite end of the spectrum, that famous or infamous essay uh, written years ago by Tvetan Todorov, in which he speaks and really gives as the figure of his being in between as schizophrenia. Uh, and, and Yoko or, or Ijaba would be doing exactly the opposite um, to that. So coming to, to the final, final um, uh, part of my presentation, uh, what I, I think you can see in, in these and other writers is a combination of different devices that include irony, humor, caricature, the rewriting of Italian classics, and a lot of forms that have, again, emerged in many of the case studies that we've heard over the last two days. Um, Anti-realist techniques, uh, a lot of anti-realist and anti-representational techniques, polyphony, multilingualism, all of these things brought together to try and reconfigure uh, a space in which translation is something much more dynamic, and which is not confined to this binary of, I start here in the self-contained culture with self-contained text, and I end up here in this final static um, other element. All of these, um, the writers that, that I've, uh, I've spoken about, the two, but also the others I could have spoken about, occupy a public space, very consciously so, uh, and they are, in a sense, uh, quite close, certainly with Jamba and, and with um, Amara, to a kind of new sense of a public intellectual in a way. Um, they address multiple audiences, often explicitly so, and polemically or provokingly so. There's that sense of provocation, again, that we were talking about yesterday. And always repeatedly and consciously translating and foregrounding translation in what they do. So what does that do to the ethics that I wanted to talk about? And I've got about four minutes, is that okay? Yes. So, um, the kind of ethics of translation and of travel and of migration that emerges from these and from similar attempts to, to be in between, to mediate, and I don't mean in between in a kind of abstract, kind of other third place, space way um, at all. I mean, literally, emotionally, um, in terms of effect, affect of politics, you know, mediating is what I mean, not being in between and in any other way. What does it mean to, to attempt to construct an ethics and a politics of translation from this kind of position? For me, it means first to, to uh, recognize the unstable nature of translation. And then also recognition of the in-betweenness of translation and of translators as agents. And agents who, as we were saying, um, uh, always work also with other agents. And to me, um, what seems much more productive than an idea and a, and a core concept of truth is uh, a core concept at, at the core of these ethics and politics of honesty, um, both as a moral commitment and as a political one, um, and, and, and also as an aesthetic one. And I think that, that combination of the moral, the politics, and the aesthetics is a very cogent uh, mixture um, today and in today's world. If I am honest, I promise to say what I think, what I understand, I promise to act and to behave to the best of my abilities at all time and with clear intentions. And promise here for me is the operative word, is the important word. Now, um, Judith Butler uh, has recently written on the promise, uh, looking back at, um, at the idea of the promise through Derrida, Freud, Nietzsche. Now, she was talking about um, capital punishment of all things, but I found her work extremely interesting in rethinking also an idea of 
honesty and of the promise at the core of translation. So she was talking about uh, the promise as a contract, an economic model, a capitalist model, which ultimately locks us up into a cycle of failure and of punishment, of guilt and of cruelty. And let me read you just a, a little bit of a quotation from Butler's uh, piece to um, um, uh, uh, explain what I mean. So she talks about um, the promise as this contract. If one wants to keep a promise, one must burn memory into the will, submit to or submit oneself to a reign of terror in the name of, mor of morality, administer pain to oneself in order to ensure one's continuity and calculability through time. If I am to be moral and keep my promises, I will remember what I promised and remain the same I who first uttered that promise, resisting any circumstances that might alter its continuity through time, never dozing when wakefulness is needed. The promise takes on another meaning in Nietzsche when what I have promised is precisely to repay a debt, a promise by which I enter into and become bound by a certain kind of contract. What I have apparently burned into the will or I've had burned there is a promise to remember and repay that debt, to realize the promise within a calculable period of time and so to become a calculable creature. I can be counted on to count the time and count up the money to make the repayment. That accountability is the promise. I can count on myself and others to count and, and others can count on me. If I prove capable of making a contract, I can receive a loan and be relied on to pay it back with interest so that the lender can accumulate wealth from my debt in a predictable way. And if I default, the law will intervene to protect his interest in the interest uh, he exacts from me. Now, this is really interesting because you've heard in there both this idea of the, the subject has to have this absolute continuity and must refuse anything that might actually, actually alter that continuity. And this idea of the promise as a debt with an economic contract and also a punishment. And I was thinking when I was reading this how much this also explains Shylock and Shylock's position in Shakespeare mentions of Venice, for instance, where he has to make violence to himself in order to exact the payment of the debt. But Butler says also, does debt forgiveness enter into this picture? What would be its psychic equivalent? Would it perhaps be the operation of pardon as a deinstitutionalization, um, deinstitutionalizing force, including She's talking, remember, about um, capital punishment, the deinstitutionalization of sovereignty and the death penalty. And when she gave uh, this paper in New York a year and a half ago, she added to this a, um, a discussion of the promise in a completely different way, which um, she wasn't talking about in terms of speech acts, but to me it makes immediate sense if you think about the promise of the speech acts. What she was saying is the promise, as a promise, is not a statement of what makes it a promise is the possibility of failure. If I promise that I'll be here tomorrow, it's because there is the possibility that I might not be here. Otherwise, I just state that I will be here tomorrow. So if there is in that promise already the possibility of failure, then there has to be also the possibility of pardon. If I accept your promise, I must accept it as a promise. And the example she gave was a very, very personal one and a very poignant one, because it was about Derrida, from whom she was starting as a theorist, but also as a close friend. And she was talking about Derrida, already very ill, um, almost dying, and the fact that he had, uh, he was part of the um, PhD commission, the, 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 um, the, the supervising commission of an American candidate, and he, uh, she, the, the candidate wrote to him and said, you know, I, I, I understand that you're not well, and if you will not be able to come to my bar, to my discussion, obviously, you know, I, I understand that. And he wrote back and said, of course I will be there, I promised. And, and Butler said, and of course he couldn't be there. And actually Butler had to stand in for him. But what she was saying is the promise here is the gesture that already includes the possibility of failure and therefore the possibility of pardon. Now, what does that do, um, you know, about, due to the kind of ethics and politics that I was, was talking about? The pro promise, I think, is also an apt figure for a notion of translation based on honesty. Translation as a gesture of opening, a gift perhaps, in the sense in which anthropologists and scholars of culture such as Marcel Mauss uh, um, in the early 20th century understood the gift as a gesture which ultimately is also a contract and which is both gratuitous and indispensable, both highly codified and superfluous, but always social as well as individual. 
a gesture which also always carries both the risk of failure and the disruptive, dynamic, destabilizing potential of change. Like any interrelational gesture, any gesture that positions us in between and therefore outside the group in a space which exposes us to failure and requires us to be honest, to show our true colors, and like any real promise, also, like the gift, translation requires reciprocity, requires the responding gesture of trust. It demands a response, an engagement, and in implying failure, it also commits us, as the receivers of translation, to the possibility of pardon. Oh, okay.